Hey guys, welcome back to In the Mind of Frage, a podcast that's all about interviews, experiences, and entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Sarah Frazier, and I am so happy that you are taking the time to listen to this podcast and be with us today. Also, we are doing a survey to find out more about what you want to hear more of, what you want to hear less of. If you could, you'll see in the podcast description that there is a link survey.lipson.com slash hey phrase podcast if you could copy and paste that and just fill out the just five or six quick questions we'd be so grateful here is part three of my interview with rob Shear. it's crazy you know that he called me out i guess yes <laughs> called i mean me out wow talk and about a gift i you said know? i told you we don't talk about that and he said do you realize all these years, you have not talked about it. The number of kids you have not been able to help. Wow. That was such an eye opener for me to come to a realization that I was doing exactly what I didn't want anybody else to do. I was thinking about myself. I was worried about what you all thought about me. And I was only consumed with the picture as it looked, instead of really being consumed with what I should do, which is be a better person. You know, let people love me and be genuine and love me. And so at that moment was like, it, that was, you know, in my 30s meeting Reese, you know, I was able to, to deal with so much, but that was the moment where it was like, wow. Holy. I have to now be genuine to the core not just in the front to the core and it that was that was to me was like almost like a rebirth and so from that moment forward you started talking about your story like you would talk started about the talking abuse, about my story about- yes yeah yeah i started talking about my story in 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 slow motion you know right um but i started talking about it i started letting people know you know um as as we were going through the the system to adopt um you know i i started you know really opening up and letting people know that you know what you might think that those are those kids i was one of those kids you know and look at me now um so yeah so i mean and the journey started and it was it was a slow journey it took forever it seemed like we started the process in august um of 2008 and it wasn't until january the 15th of 2009 that we received our first two kids oh my god and they're like these dolls oh <laughs> <laughs> we won the lottery with these kids they're amazing Amazing. And you have four children, four. actually. So we have an eight-year-old little boy, and we have two 10-year-olds who, by the way, are not twins or three months apart. Okay. And then we have our daughter who just turned 13. So when they arrived, wow. they were four, they were six months, two, two, and four. Um, and we got them all within three months. So we went from these two guys hanging out at cocktail parties to having four kids within three months at living in the city of D.C. Oh, my God. Was that such a shock? Were you like, what it am was, I going to okay, do? Okay, so I will tell you, the shock <laughs> is, that's an understatement of what it was. It was just like, Reese and I now, we talk, you know, almost 10 years later, we talk and laugh and say, we were such in a fog those first <laughs> two years, you know, between diapers and, you know, my all my children are in therapy, you know, they, sure. they came from the system, they um, they came from pretty bad situations, you know, my, my one son entered the system, his mother was 12. Um, he came with three broken ribs and bleeding of the brain. Um, my other son, we were told, would never walk and never talk. Um, he had such severe fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and I remember the social worker saying, are you sure you want this one? Mm. This one. You know, um, it was rough. It was rough. I remember, you know, Reese would um, leave work and he would go to the daycare three times a day to move Makai's arms and legs because we refused to allow people to say to us that 
he was never going to talk or never walk. Um, hiring an education attorney and suing the District of Columbia because they didn't want to give Mackay his speech therapy because why waste those hours on a kid who the doctor said wasn't going to talk? Wow. Um, which you won, by the way, right? Which we won, by the way. And the only thing, when the judge asked what did we want and that we would pay attorney fees, we said, no, just give us the hours that our son deserves. And so he not only gave us the hours, but he gave us extra hours for therapy for Makai for speech. Um, but you know what? That's what parents do. Yeah, that's, that's what you That's what do. parents do. It is an investment into our future, seriously. And we have to invest today. And that's what Reese and I had decided, that we were investing. So before we talk comfort cases, you how did the Upworthy video come okay. about? Were you were you telling people your story? Were you blogging about it? No, and just like I, it you know, people were talking about my story. So they were talking about my story because of the charity. We started the charity and um, people were interviewing us and asking us about our, you know, our our charity. My daughter actually had been cho I gave a speech in D.C. and a woman heard me give the speech and she came up to me and she says, I'm a writer for American Girl magazine. Yes. And she said, and I'd like to come and talk to you and your husband and your daughter. Um, I think this would be an amazing story. She says, mind you, there's thousands of stories that are written all the time for American Girl, so I can't guarantee they'll pick up my story. She's like, but I really think that this is this is a story here. So she came, and she um, came to our farm, and she interviewed um, my daughter, and she wrote a story, and... Um, that was about two years ago, and all of a sudden we get a certified letter from Mattel and said, congratulations, your daughter has been chosen as the American girl, um, and it will be, the magazine will come out at Christmas, which is their largest edition. Oh, I'm sure. And she, and, and that truly is what opened up, you wow. know, um, the whole door of our story. Um, even though we didn't talk about this, my story in the magazine, um, it got people wanting to ask about the Sheer family. Yeah. Um, and so when people ask, we do what my children tell us all the time. We tell our story because we have to be proud of our story. Yeah. We all should be proud of where we came from. Even as hard as it might be, remember, you are the person you are today because of where you came from. Yes, 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 yes. Um, you recently went to your high school uh, reunion. It might have been a couple yeah, years ago, no, actually. Just last year. Don't age me year. too much. Um, <laughs> so la last year, I went to my... my 30th high school reunion. And by this time, mind you, um, uh, everybody knew, knows me. So even though I was the kid who wasn't popular and I was homeless my senior year and, you know, I had holes in my shoes, I now am 50 years old and everybody's connecting with me on Facebook because at that point I'd already been, I'd done the Today Show. Ellen. I, I, I hadn't done Ellen yet by my 50th, but I had oh, done wow. the Today Show. I had done Whoopi Goldberg had talked about me on The View. We had done every local news station there is. Um, CNN had already done one interview with us. Um, so you, people were like connecting with me and they, already, they were, you know, social media, Facebook, Instagram. And so when I got to my 50th high school reunion, I um, went around and I apologized to people. Uh. And I apologized for stealing food off their trays because I was that kid. Hmm because I was so hungry my senior year of high school that I would steal food. And I felt like I, I owed that to them. And even though ugh, people were not like, well, are you kidding me? Um, I had to do that. Wow. Yeah, that was, I, I can't believe you did that. Yeah. Yeah, but that's what you should do. You know, wow. you get people to forgive you for your wrongdoings. And again, as I said this earlier, you have to forgive and move on. If it's, mm. It absolutely mind boggles me when I see people forgive and still hold on to that baggage because then they have not really forgiven. You know, yeah. you have to forgive and move on and don't look back. And put the work in whatever it requires. Exactly. You know, yours was through Reese and through yep. therapy. And obviously, I'm sure you have great friends and, you know, uh, support. Amazing support group. Amazing yeah. support group. What is one thing, I mean... 
what would you tell people? Because we, so many people listen to this podcast. Many have been through terrible abuse that still, I think, you know, you probably always carry some of it with you. You always carry some of it. It defines you in so many ways, you know. But, what but you, you can't you... allow it to consume you. Mm. See, that is one of the things that I see, and, and people might, I, are going to disagree. I hear a lot as I go around and talk, and I hear people yeah. say, you know, um, oh, my poor past and all my and I'm like you know what yeah you're right but what are you going to take from that to better yourself Mm. what are you going to take from that to better your community you know Mm. maybe the fact that you know for me the abuse that I had in foster care maybe it's the fact that you know going and helping foster kids maybe the fact that you in high school lost your your father I'm going to tell you something in high school for you to lose your parent is devastating so maybe your healing is going to a school and connecting with a kid whose father is dying of terminal cancer and letting them know that you feel what they're feeling yeah that's really good. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you don't hold on to any of that as like any reason to be more sensitive or to, I mean, you literally had this happen and you're like, I've forgiven. I, I'm empowered. I'm, and you don't, cause like anytime I see you, hear you and with you, it's never like I'm a victim. You never, no. I never get that sense no, from you at all. Not a victim at all. You know, wow. you make yourself a victim and you're not going to make me a victim. I'm a survivor. Damn, that is so good. Do you ever have bad days? Like, what do you do to talk yourself up? Oh my gosh, I have bad days. (laughs) Ask Reese. As Reese, um, of course I have bad days. You know, I have bad days. I snap. You know, I, I, I there's times I have bad parenting fails. I, I, I just was telling the therapist the other day. You know, God, I, I so handled this one situation wrong with my son. You know, right. um, you know, but like she said, but the one thing, Rob, is that you realized it and you're learning from it. And we're all a learning progress. We don't stop. Just because I'm 50 and gone through what I went through, I'm still learning. I'm learning how to be a dad. I never had anybody be a good dad to me. I'm learning how to be a good husband. You know, yeah. I never watched anyone be a good husband. You know? Right. So I'm learning how to do that. I'm learning how to be a good person because I really never had anyone be a good person. Yeah. And so those are things that really hit the core of me so when I have a bad day I realize that and I know this sounds cliche but tomorrow morning the book starts again Hmm. the book starts again tomorrow morning it really does I cannot hold on to what happened yesterday I can only make tomorrow better I love. So your kids, this is the craziest thing, because this was not that long ago. Your kids come to your home um, that you fostered and adopt the same way that you same did. Same way. Trash bags. Trash bags. Trash they carry bags. their belongings. Oh, my gosh. I was absolutely stunned when the first two children arrived with these trash bags. And I said to the social worker, are you kidding me? Are you telling me that we're now almost 40 years into when I was in care and you're, we're still having kids carry trash bags around? And she says it was the easiest thing for us to do. Yeah, it was crazy, Ugh. crazy. And that's what prompted Comfort Cases. That's what cases. prompted us for Comfort Cases. So the other two children arrive. Again, trash bags. My daughter was four years old. She didn't even have a toothbrush. She had eight cavities. You know, my son who was six months old didn't even have a baby's blanket. This is in 2009. 2009. This is not that long ago. 2009. My daughter had eight cavities at the age of four because no one stopped to brush her teeth. That's not acceptable. Our children deserve better than that. And so three and a half years ago, my husband and I decided that we're going to do something about it. We're not going to be leaders. And by the way, I feel we're all leaders. Right. But if you're going to become a leader and be a leader, you do not have the option to stand on the sideline and watch the game being played. You have to get in there and play it. And that's what we decided to do. And we got in there and we were going to play. And what we were going to do is we were going to make sure that when a child enters foster care on their first night, that they have some sense of belonging that you know they're given a brand new pair of pajamas with a tag they're yeah. given a toothbrush they're given their own bar of soap they're given right. a blanket that wrap themselves up to let them know as a community we love them as a community we care about them but the most important thing is we need to let them know as a community 
we want them. Right. They just want to be wanted. I said that in my video. Yeah. It was an aha moment for me. A aha moment at 49. I had not turned 50 when that video was taped. That was an aha moment for me. And by the way, I didn't even remember saying that until I saw the video in February that I said that. And it was like, wow, it, I'm right. Yeah. We just all want to be wanted. Wow. So you have started this amazing organization that gives these kids that sense of belonging and these these items. And how old is the organization? So three and a half years. So in October, it'll be four years. And in that time, we now give cases to 24 states. Wow. We have given almost 30,000 cases out. We are a 100% nonprofit with no corporate sponsors. Hey, corporations, if you're hearing me out there. Um, yeah, um, you'll be getting you one, know, I'm sure. We, we have no corporate sponsors. What we have is we have a community. See, it doesn't matter whether you live in Dallas, Texas, or you live in Arlington, Virginia. Right. We are all part of the same community. And somewhere along the lines and down the road, we have forgotten that. We have yeah. forgotten why community was built. See, I tell people all the time, community was not built for all of us to live in houses where the colors match and the bushes are all the same. Community was built for you and I to take care of each other. Right. So if you have a piece of bread and I'm hungry, you really should be sharing that bread with me. That's what builds our community. Um, we also connected because I'm kind of taking the first steps with my boyfriend. We're, we're thinking about fostering to a so doctor. I, I've always had a calling to, you know, to just, I've always felt the same way, I guess, Reese did in the sense of like, how can I bring a kid into this world when there are kids that need a home? You know, I mean, there are just kids and, and I grew up with those kids too, you know? And so it's like, God, I want to give that to a child, you know? It's amazing. That, let me tell you, that doing that is the most unselfish act you could ever imagine. Well, I hope giving, it happens. Giving, I'm nervous. Well, I, you know, the fact that you're, like I said to you earlier, the fact that you're even educating yourself about the foster care system is a big step. Right. It is a big step. And foster care is not for everyone to become foster parents. I get that. I'm a, right. I, I understand that. We all should not be parents, by the way, whether it's foster care, adopt, or even have them naturally. That's a good point, um, too. You know, I always think it's funny when you, the, what you go through to be a foster parent. And I think to myself, my gosh, the only thing that you have to do is buy somebody a couple cocktails and you could become a parent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like what you have to go through. Yeah, you're right. The process to become a foster parent is insane. Background check. Yeah. And um, the they, problem is, is that they don't do anything about it. I'm going to tell you, we have amazing foster parents out there. Yeah. But I want to start talking about the ones that shouldn't be foster parents. I want to talk about the fact that we are looking too much for beds and not homes. These kids deserve homes. They don't just deserve beds. Beds. Because the, the the thing that you find out if once you look into this is you're paid to be a foster parent. Yeah, you're you, paid. It's a money making industry that's being made on the backs of children. And all you foster parents out there are gonna say, Oh my god, how can he say that? I'm gonna tell you right now. When you have four children arrive in your home that had already been in several other foster homes and they still have trash bags and they do not have a toothbrush and they do not have a teddy bear and they do not have a blanket, that's you are insane. making money on the backs of these children. We need accountability. Accountability is something that we lack in our system. You know, I say this all the time to people. Our system is not broken. So let's get, let's get it clear right now. The system is not broken. The system is shattered. Wow. Broken things you can put back together. I tell my boys that all the time. They break a toy, bring it to daddy, bring me the super glue. We can put it back together. But my kids know that when something is shattered, it must be rebuilt. Built. We have to rebuild our foster care system. Now, what needs to be done? Give us some... So I'm going to tell you, the first thing okay. that we got to do is we have to ban trash bags for kids in foster care. And I don't care how easy it is for social workers to get them out of their drawer instead of calling comfort cases. Um, we have to ban trash bags. That's step number one. Step okay. number two, we have to educate our public about kids in foster care. And what needs to be known? Known that, number one, these are not bad kids. Okay. There's no such thing as a bad kid. These are kids that need to be redirected and shown what unconditional love truly is. See, that truly is what a child wants. Right. You know, these children who act out, they're acting out because we have given them no other choice. Right. We have to love them even more. I'm going to tell you, that is a key component with children in care. When they push you back, you have to pull them closer. Right. When they tell you they hate you, you have to tell them you love them even twice as many times. Wow. They are testing the boundaries because 
They have been let down. You have let them down. I have let them down. We as a community has let them down. We have to let them know that that net underneath of them is as secure as it will ever be. Wow. And it doesn't matter what you do or what you say. I'm still going to love you. And I'm still going to be there next to you. And I'm still going to go through this path. And then the next thing you know we have to do is we have to give these kids opportunities. You know, we have 428,000 kids in foster care. And I'm going to let you know right now that only 3% of those kids will go on and graduate at a four-year college. If that was happening in your town, if that was happening in your school district, we would be protesting. We would be asking for the principal and the school superintendent's heads on a platter. Yep. No one discussed this with kids in foster care. We have to let them know that they have opportunities. We have to let them know that just because of the cards that were dealt for them does not mean the future that they have to hold. Right. That is such a key thing to me. You know, I tell people all the time, the color of their skin does not separate us. Right. It is our education level. We must get our children in foster care to love to be educated and know that they have just as many opportunities as you did. Right. And they don't feel that. Then the other thing is, is we have to set them up for success financially. See, when you turn 18 or 19 in some states, you immediately are put out on the street. So all these years, these kids don't have any savings account. They have no way to get an apartment. They don't even know what credit scores are. Sure. Most of them have had their parents take their credit scores and ruin their credit. I've seen that happen. Yep. We have to educate them on that. And then we have to set them up for financial success. We should be taking a little bit of that stipend that we're giving these foster parents. And it has to be mandatory to go in a savings account for these children. Great I'm telling idea. You That's that a great that idea. Is what should happen for us to start rebuilding our shattered system? Are we close at all to these We're steps nowhere happening? Nowhere near close. We're not even discussing it. Wow. We're not even discussing it. And let's talk about another thing that we need to talk about. The first thing is, is we understand these kids are foster children. Stop calling them that. They're children. Hmm. Yeah. We're labeling. We label too many things in our country. Mm. We automatically label these children with a stigma that we have for 35, 40 years have been those kids. Yeah. These are children. That's what we need to start talking about. These children, not these foster children, these children who deserve to have a chance. The choices their parents made should not define the choices that we are giving them. Right. We should give them the future. And we're not. Wow. Oh, my God. And can people get on board with your advocacy through Comfort Cases? I would love that. Go to comfortcases.org. Oh, you guys are just going to blow up. Send me messages. What I need people to stand with me and march to say we are not going to accept this any longer. When do we need to do it? We're like on board. We're ready. You know, the movement started. The movement has started. Are you going to do an actual march? Are you going to go? I want to do something. I want to do. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that I'm people in. will come to me and help me again. We're starting you know, today. I, when do we want to do I, it? We need to do something. We need to we need to march to our to, we need to march to Capitol Hill and say, listen, because they're the ones who give this money out, by the way. They, they keep giving to they these foster keep parents. They giving to the states that are giving to the foster families. And again, I get it. They're, they're, they need... Sure, you gotta get... I mean, you have to have money to of help, course, you know, feed this kid. Raise and, a child. I don't yeah. have a problem with that, but let me tell you what I have a problem with. Let's talk about RESPA. It <gasps> is a huge thing. It is, to me, a I dirty word. And the fact that we have RESPA in our system is disgusting. And let me explain to you your listeners what RESPA is. So when a child comes into foster care, the foster family is given RESPA. And what RESPA means is I can call them up, my social worker, and say, by the way, my husband and I want to take our biological children on vacation, so you need to come and pick this kid up and take them for a week. I need RESPA. You know what? This weekend, I just need a break. I need a break this weekend. Come and get this kid because I have RESPA. That's not acceptable. That is insane. Let me tell you something. As a parent, you don't get a break, by the way. <laughs> yeah, okay? right. Let's get real. You get a break when my kids are asleep. Whew. 
I get to breathe. Okay? Right. Um, but it, it, it's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And you blew my mind with the respite thing that, like, if these parents are taking foster kids, but they have their own biological, they can take their kids on a biological vacation, leave their foster children for respite. Yes. That's insane. Yes. And it happens. It happens. You know, it oh. happens. I remember when we were we were going, the kids were with us the first year. The kids, um, actually, we were year two. The kids were with us, and we were going on vacation. And um, we were going to go to Disney World. And um, we had to get permission because you can't take the children out for 50-mile radius. And the and they asked the parents, and the parents said no. And the judge said, why not? Oh, my and God. the parents were like, oh, you can put them in RESPA. They knew about it because they were products of the system. And... Um, I remember saying to the judge, we won't go. These are the parents of your own kids while you parents were fostering to adopt. kids while you were fostering. And the social worker said, you know, you could just put them in RESPA. And I, we were like, we're not going. The judge ended up allowing us to go. But it just, again, it was that whole RESPA Holy thing crap. that just blows my mind. And, and I know pe- I, there are foster parents who that's all they do is RESPA, where they're the parents that they come and bring the child to. I mean, and they get paid to do RESPA. So we're, mm. we're paying the foster parents. We're paying the RESPA. You know, it's just to me, it just doesn't make sense. Wow. Oh, my God, Rob. People, I, they need to go to comfortcases.org. Comfortcases.org. Donate. Let's get, I mean. Let's talk get, about Let's talk it. about it because you have a Facebook page we so we Facebook can start. So, so you can go to our Comfort Case Facebook page. You can go to Rob Shear to my fan page. Connect with me there. Send me messages. Let's talk about it. Let's get a I movement going. It. Let's figure out what we're going to do. And by the way, I want people to understand something. We have amazing social workers out there. Yeah. This isn't yeah. a crack on social workers. They are underpaid overworked their case files are so piled up it's not even funny and let's talk about those social workers where they're expected to not only manage these children but also do the things that as a parent you should be doing foster parents if you're listening to me and you call your social worker to take your foster child to the doctor shame on you yeah that is your responsibility That is your responsibility. And I talk to social workers all over the United States who say they spend so much time having to take Johnny to tutoring, taking him to the dentist, taking him to the doctor, taking him to the visitation. You know, no wonder kids fall through the cracks. I had no idea that was the system. Because a foster parent isn't required to do that. Wow. Let's change that. If you choose to take this path, you choose to be a parent, not a foster parent, a parent. Whether that parent is for a month, a day, a year, or for the rest of this child's life, you owe them that. Take them to the doctor. Rob, you are amazing. I love calling you my friend. You are changing lives. You're, this next chapter for your life has just started. Just and started. You and Reese and your family and your kids are just reaching so many millions of people. And thank you for giving us this just in-depth exclusive interview. Ah! I love you. Thank you. You're I amazing. Love you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Check out comfortcases.org, or you can also follow Rob on his public page, Rob Shear. All right. More to come, guys. Thanks. How amazing is Rob Shear? We love him. I hope you enjoyed this three-part series. There is so much more to come. And also, if you like this podcast series, if you like my other shows, will you head to iTunes and subscribe? It's Hey Frage Podcast. Boom. Leave me a review. Hit five stars, please. Uh, and tell me what you like. So thank you so much for joining the Hey Frage Podcast today. And I'll see you guys next week. Hey, hey, phrase. What's the phrase that you hear every day? Hey, phrase. What's the phrase that you hear? Tune in, yeah, you gotta tune in. Sarah Frazier on the mic, and she about to begin the co host with the most born one looking fleek. Take it from me, you should be listening. Live from the nation's pop pop.